Tonight, our featured presentation is entitled, A Primer on Transgender Health. And it's being presented by William Campbell and Laura Dickey. William is a nationally board certified family nurse practitioner who trained at Johns Hopkins, mm, Johns Hopkins Nursing School, where he graduated with a master's in nursing. For the past five years, he served as clinical program director at Carl Vogel Center in Washington, D.C., which is a nonprofit community based organization that provides multidisciplinary and integrated medical health care. They specialize in helping medically underserved individuals to become full partners and informed advocates in managing their health. William's primary areas of practice are internal medicine and infectious disease. Dr. Lord Dickey earned his PhD in counseling psychology from the University of North Dakota. He holds a master's in applied behavioral science and completed a one-year pre-doctoral internship at, of counseling and psychological services at Duke University in Durham, North Carolina. Laura is a female-to-male transgender person and has been actively involved in the American Psychological Association. He served as the chair for the American Psychological Association's Graduate Students Committee on Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Concerns. He also served for four years as the co-chair for the Committee for Transgender and Gender Variance Issues for the Society for Psychological Study of LGBT Issues. He currently is a fellow here at Morehouse School of Medicine in the Satcher Leadership Institute. Application for CME credit has been filed with the American Academy of Family Physicians and has been approved for one hour of CME. Tonight's presentation will allow you to ask questions throughout, so please feel free to type them into the Q&A box and submit them. Our speakers will grab them as they go along. Additionally, they should pause at some points to ask for questions. So with all of that said, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome William Campbell and Dr. Laura Dickey. Thank you, Sabrina. Um, I just wanted to start by saying I don't have any disclosures, and um, I wanted to say that primarily my area of expertise in transgender health is uh, male to female transgender persons. Um, and since you already, I don't know, Lord, if you wanted to add anything else to the introduction there, or should we move uh, no, on? No, not at all. Just I also don't have any uh, conflict of interest disclosures to give, and um, while I don't have a lot of clinical experience uh, counseling transgender people, I have my own life experience and a lot of research experience in that area. Okay. So today's learning objectives, we want to explore the scope of unmet health care needs of transgender population, increase your historical knowledge and cultural interest in the transgender community, discover a spectrum of human gender and sexual expression, gain confidence for addressing the unmet health care needs for the transgender patients in primary health care settings, and also to learn basic concepts about hormone management. Basically, we want to increase your uh, comfort level a little bit today. So I want to start off with some uh, basic definitions, and uh, this will all become clear after I sort of work through these uh, five main definitions here, but you heard William talk about uh, male to female or MTF. That's a person whose birth assigned sex was male and they've transitioned either socially or medically and live as female. You also have female to male, which is the opposite, uh, assigned female at birth and now, like me, uh, live as male. A cross-dresser is an individual who uh, enjoys cross-dressing cross from time to time, uh, but that's really um, not the major part of their identity. So when you think about transgender people, they have a part-time trans identity where someone like me has a full-time trans identity. When you see me, you think this is a male, and you don't don't see a person who had a female history. 
Um, transvestic fetishism is a controversial term within the trans community because um, it, generally speaking, people who cross-dress are not doing it for erotic purposes. There are people who do get aroused by that, um, but I would say the majority of the people who I've interfaced with in the trans community think that this is a disorder that needs to come out of the DSM um, because it's uh, unfairly causing uh, problems with folks, uh, even if they aren't dressing for erotic purposes. Drag kings and drag queens. Uh, drag queens are typically gay men. Uh, drag kings aren't necessarily lesbians, um, but they're people who dress in the opposite sex or gender, uh, typically to um, for performance purposes. And the other thing that's important about that and what's different about, say, a drag queen and a male cross-dresser is a male cross-dresser is trying to uh, look like a female, where a drag queen is probably uh, over-feminizing their look, uh, as opposed to trying to look, I can't remember what the right word is, but um, they're kind of over the top in terms of how they dress as women. Um, so those are kind of some basic definitions. I put this slide in here to uh, kind of represent the fact that there's all kinds of ways people describe themselves as trans. And uh, what's important from my perspective for folks to know is you need to honor whatever the identity is that your patient or client asks you uh, or tells you is true for them. And also be aware that that can change over time. It's not unheard of that someone will start as a cross-dresser and uh, some years later make a decision to make a social or a medical transition. So uh, it can change over time. Questions about that part? Okay, I'll go over some definitions here. Uh, from the DSM-4, uh, we have uh, gender identity disorder. Uh, this is characterized by strong and persistent cross-gender identification. And persistent is the key word there. Uh, persistent discomfort in their uh, sex or sense of inappropriateness in their gender. Uh, the ICD-9 also has some definitions. Transsexualism, which is desire to live and be accepted as a member of the opposite sex, usually want body congruency. The identity has been, again, the key word here, persistent for at least two years. The disorder is not a symptom of another mental disorder or chromosomal abnormality. There's dual role transvestism, criteria they wear the clothes of the opposite sex to experience temporary, I guess that would be the key word there, membership in the opposite sex. There's no sexual motivation in cross-dressing and the individual has no desire for permanent change to opposite sex and this could be um, somebody who just you know could could even incorporate uh, a, a drag type scenario here um, the gender identity disorder not otherwise specified there's no criteria but that is also in the um, ICD-9 and we'll talk about a little bit hopefully in the, why the persistent is important when we get to that part of the talk So in terms of some uh, historical perspective with regard to uh, trans identities, this is not a new phenomenon. Uh, trans people have existed in most societies uh, throughout time. Examples here, Pope Joan, ancient cultures have described a third gender. Um, I was reading something in an email the other day that um, Jewish uh, readings recognize four genders, uh, male, female, and 
I wish I remembered all of what I'd read in that message, but there are four genders recognized in some uh, Jewish uh, way, Jewish uh, religious thoughts. Uh, Egypt, Mesopotamia, the Mayans, Incans. Uh, Two-spirit is a term that comes from Native American cultures. You might have heard the term Burdash in the past. That's definite, definitely considered a pejorative term to Native American people because it was something that was created by the white people to describe two-spirit individuals. It's also important to note that two-spirit can mean both transgender and it could also mean gay or lesbian, uh, depending on the Native American culture. Um, certainly in Greek mythology, uh, modern pioneers in the transsexual movement, Christine, Christine Jorgensen is believed to be the first American to undergo uh, surgical reassignment. That happened, I believe, in Denmark. And then uh, Renee Richards, I think, made uh, quite a bit of, had got quite a bit of media attention. I want to say that was back in the 70s or 80s. I can't remember when that was, but she wanted to um, participate in the women's tennis tour. And there was a lot of discussion about whether or not she should be able to or um, whether she had an unfair advantage for having been born in a male body. Uh, modern culture, uh, if any of you have watched Dancing with the Stars this last season, you probably saw Chaz Bono on there. Um, he also had a recent TV special on the uh, Oprah Winfrey's network and has a book out about his life and Candace Kane, and here's a picture of Candace. Uh, male to female individual, uh, you look at this person and you know, much like you look at me and don't see a female history, you look at her and you don't see a male history. In terms of some statistics, uh, this is a really difficult uh, number to pin down. While it's not a common occurrence, I don't think anybody really knows what the true prevalence rates are. The numbers that you see here on this slide, the one in about 12,000 males and about 30,000 females, I believe is what's listed in the DSM. Danish studies have been higher. Uh, other studies have shown higher prevalence. It will be very interesting to see what the American Psychiatric Association does with prevalence data in the DSM-5, which is due out in March of 2013, I believe, or maybe, maybe May of that year. One of the things that's important to know in terms of hate violence, 20% of uh, the LGBT community uh, is, has had hate-related violence. 40% of that is police-initiated. In a study that was conducted in San Francisco, HIV rates are pretty high. You have over 50% of trans people without health insurance. <laughs> and 15 to 20 percent uh, report being homeless. Lots of uh, verbal abuse. A recent study, and actually these two uh, national transgender studies were a transgender discrimination study. I double checked the source on that. 41 percent of people in a national study indicated that they'd had, uh, re had attempted suicide at some point. When you compare that to the general population, it's only about it's less than 2% of people have a history of having attempted suicide. And uh, transgender people, uh, HIV rates are four times higher than the national rate for HIV infection. So uh, talking about care, and uh, we'll be talking about primary care today as well, 19% um, reported being refused care during two due to their transgender or gender nonconformity, um, and that was even higher in persons of color. 28% reported harassment in a medical setting. 2% reported violence in a medical setting. And uh, lack of provider knowledge, 50% reported having to teach their medical provider about transgender care. And that was from the National Transgender Discrimination Survey. So when you're thinking of working with your patients and clients, 
when as a provider is it really necessary for you to know about a transgender patient's surgical status? Obviously, if you're going to be doing any kind of exams in the genital area, that would be important. But if you're seeing someone for a cold or the flu or, um, you know, routine kinds of care that you give in a primary care setting, there's no reason why you need to know anything about their surgical status. I see a question from uh, Sabrina regarding uh, what do we attribute the high HIV rate to? Um, I'm not sure that there's any specific this has caused it, but there are a lot of people, and most of the HIV, I believe, has been reported in male to female individuals, and there are a lot of male to female individuals who, because they've lost their job, have decided to work in street economies, doing sex work and uh, other kinds of street trade, and as you know, sex workers are much more likely to get HIV than uh, someone who isn't just by uh, virtue of the fact that they're engaging in sex on a much more regular basis likely than the average person does. So I think that's uh, one place where uh, that would be a particularly high risk. William, do you know of any other data that talks about that why HIV is I, I, I would I would tend to agree. I, I think it there's because of the the incidence of homelessness and um, and you know there's a lot of uh, sex work and even in people who are transitioning to uh, pay for things like hormones and surgeries um, you know there are people who you know result to uh, different types of economies as you as you put um, but uh, I beyond that beyond the, there actually being that correlation I don't know exactly why. So um, back to the slide, how do you ask patients about their preferred gender? Just like that. You ask it from a place of wanting to know as opposed to a place of some kind of uh, eerie curiosity that doesn't feel safe. Uh, and simply ask them, I'm, I want to be respectful. Uh, what pronouns do you want me to use? Uh, when I work with you. It's that simple. What name would you like me to use? It's that simple. It doesn't have to be complicated. And if you ask it in a sort of straightforward, uh, matter-of-fact way, you're less likely to offend the trans patient or client than if you keep stumbling over he and she and, and God forbid you use they and it. It happens. Um, Unless somebody Unless asks somebody you to asks use the pronoun they, which we didn't talk about genderqueer people, but some genderqueer people prefer that pronoun when they're uh, being talked about and, and you need to use a pronoun for them. Um, what options are listed on your paperwork regarding sex and gender? Uh, I maintain that probably the easiest way to do that and not to offend trans people is to ask what is your gender and leave a blank there. People who are non-trans are likely going to put in male or female and not stumble over it and a trans person is going to have a little internal hallelujah moment because they can choose whether or not they want to out themselves as trans on the paperwork and they have a place to do that. I just included this slide because um, I think as clinicians we need to think about think out of our box and I think a lot of us were raised uh, you know in this kind of traditional model and uh, you know it's we, we have to uh, we can't carry that with us for all of our patients. So with regard to the spectrum of human expression uh, biological sex, that's about chromosomes. That's about your genitalia. Uh, as I understand it, when a child is born, the doctor receives that child. 
and looks to see if there's a penis. And if there is, the child is declared to be a boy. And if there isn't, the child is declared to be female or a girl. Um, we definitely don't have time to talk about the spectrum of issues with related to people being born intersex, but it is possible for that to be listed as a child's sex when they're born. Uh, physical sex, with trans people, you have people who are pre-op, you have people who are post-op, and you have people who are non-op. And especially with trans men, they may have chest surgery or what's also called upper surgery, but they're not likely to want uh, or to complete lower or genital surgery. And we'll talk a little bit about the surgeries later. In terms of gender identity, the gender piece, that's where male and female come in. I mean, actually, that's sort of the biological sex is the male and female. But the gender expression, the way you express yourself, is masculine or feminine. It's important to know that gender and sex is not about sexual orientation. So a trans person could be gay, could be bisexual, could be heterosexual. Uh, but that has nothing to do with their trans identity. So you see a list of different combina combinations. Someone might be masculine, a straight woman, feminine, a lesbian, M to F, transitioned, pre-op, post-op, loho, noho, which is about how much hormones they do, no hormones, low hormones. There's all kinds of different ways that people might identify themselves. And I was never... I just uh, included this. It dates me a little bit. <laughs> well, me too, but I never stayed up late enough to watch Saturday Night Live, but I did hear about Pat. <laughs> so, uh, talking about medical provider considerations and barriers, uh, these are the obvious ones, homophobia or transphobia, and sometimes that's not uh, real obvious. I showed the picture to leave it to Beaver because, uh, you know, we all have our own biases and it's hard sometimes to, to step out of those. Legal fears, I think a lot around uh, hormone management and um, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, cultural incompetency, not knowing uh, about trans people, about their culture, about things that are going on in that community. Um, lack of knowledge and training, there really isn't a whole lot uh, going on is, you know, you, you have to kind of look for the, the trainings, uh, you know, for, for CME and CEU. Um, I put this as a question, uh, Laura and I kind of bantered about this a little bit, but um, there, there are some U.S. guidelines, or they're kind of more focused towards, um, you know, people are doing endocrine, uh, endocrinologists, but uh, the, there's, there are, there are some great guidelines that we'll share at the, at the end, but um, I have had, I've been in, in, in meetings where clinicians have expressed um, that as a barrier that there is not a, a, this comprehensive U.S. guideline on trans care. Um, lack of knowledge on standards of care, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about some of the standards that are available. Um, lack of support in, in just for knowledge and, and, uh, and where to go and, and what to do for these people. Um, Office staff issues, and this is a huge barrier, I think, for people to think about when they're just trying to take care of trans people. Um, you know, names, what do we call these patients? They have a legal name, they may have a preferred name. Uh, we had an issue at my clinic. Uh, one of the admin people was upset because they weren't uh, comfortable about the, which bathroom the trans people were going to be using. Um, so what uh, what names do we use? How do we how do we label the chart? These are all things that um, kind of need to be gone through in policies and procedures. Um, and I put this down just because I, I do a lot of HIV. Uh, uh, I'm an HIV clinician, and I, I think in the early days of HIV, a lot of times we didn't know kind of what to do with that population either. And um, I think it's kind of a parallel. We're starting to to uh, we need to start to serve uh, the trans population better. So with regard to unmet needs, uh, I, I would say in general I've had, for the most part, very good uh, interactions with people in the health field when I've needed to access care. But 
if you look at that uh, national trans discrimination study, you'll uh, see reports of some, you know, the things we list here, lack of sensitivity or even competent clinicians. And that's certainly going to be the case in more rural areas than it would be in, say, big cities. Like in Atlanta, you can probably find somebody to provide you care. But is that same care available in, say, Savannah or uh, some other small town uh, in rural uh, Georgia? Uh, lack of basic primary care and preventive services. It's important to know, though, you know, when I as a trans person come in with an upper respiratory infection, that's all you need to treat. My trans status doesn't affect that. Or if I break my arm, that needs to be treated as a broken arm. It's not treated any differently because I'm trans than it would be for anything else. Now, you know, one of the issues with, and we'll talk a little bit about this later, is you need to address my medical needs based on the body parts that I have, which may be different than what uh, you would expect from a male. For example, and we'll talk a little bit about this later, as, a fe as an F to M, I never need a prostate exam. I, don't, I wasn't born with one, and I didn't get one when I transitioned. So, uh, you know, to do a rectal exam on a trans man and say your prostate looks fine uh, doesn't make any sense because there's nothing that you could have examined in that case. Um, medical management of hormones versus street drugs. Oftentimes, trans people will have to uh, rely on the black market or the internet to get their hormones. Uh, that can be a big problem uh, for some folks. And how do you work with those people when uh, when they come in for care? Do you uh, do you offer them prescriptions? Do you use some kind of an informed consent model uh, to get them the hormones that they need and and uh, certainly have a right to? We talked about the lack of guidelines yes, a few uh, slides ago. Uh, lack of legal support, safety, lack of financial resources. Uh, unemployment is a big problem in the trans community or underemployment. Uh, a lot of the research that I've seen shows that trans people are very highly educated but are not making very much money. You've got people with masters and doctorate degrees that are making less than $20,000 a year. Um, so they're uh, definitely underemployed. Mental health support, emotional support. Uh, part of that has to do with what happens uh, within one's family and, and uh, what happen, you know, how they're able to get support uh, from their loved ones or not. Uh, lack of greater societal acceptance, inclusion, and understanding. Uh, there, is, there are no national laws that protect transgender people uh, from anything. Uh, and We've tried for years to get some employment non-discrimination in place, but that still isn't there. So I could be fired from my job tomorrow simply because I'm transgender, and I would have no recourse to get that job back. I don't think that's fair. <laughs> Whether or not I can do my job shouldn't, shouldn't rely on that part of who I am. Uh, there are, uh, there have been some large-scale studies on transgender folks, but most of those have been done in Europe. They haven't been done here in the U.S. Uh, so we need to do a better job of identifying what the care needs are for the trans community and uh, to do some uh, longitudinal studies to, to uh, address those health needs. We talked about the high incidence of, of sex work. Uh, poverty issues within the trans community, body image issues, and violence targeted at the trans community. Uh, a couple Sundays ago was the National Transgender Day of Remembrance. And in the past year, uh, it's been documented that 23 people were murdered because of their gender identity. Um, that final sentence, we can and must do better. Uh, people deserve our support and care, and uh, if they can't get get that at, at their primary care physician, I'm not sure where they can.
So I wanted to start uh, by talking about an overview of the medical management. Um, basically dividing up the, uh, the areas of transgender medicine. Um, just talking about pediatric uh, field, gender identity disorder in childhood, it is an emerging field. It involves the um, individual and, and family therapy, uh, primarily hormone blockade um, to delay the onset of puberty. Um, prostheses can be used, you know, uh, to mimic uh, breast development, for example. Um, but eventual, it's to delay, the, the goal is to delay the onset of puberty for an eventual informed consent. Um, but the therapy involves focusing on decreasing the child and family members' distress regarding transgender identity. There was a recent uh, article in, I think it was CNN about this, and, and it was um, pretty controversial. Um, uh, there was a lot of comments I, I read about after it, but um, it is in a, in a new emerging field. For adult management, um, there are four basic areas, diagnostic assessment, psychotherapy, hormone therapy, and surgical treatment. And I'm going to focus mostly on, on diagnostic assessment, hormone therapy, and um, uh, a little bit about medical homes and primary care services for transgendered people. I just want to jump quickly to the question, uh, which is basically about whether or not insurance companies will cover um, medical procedures based on the gender that a person lives in. Uh, in this case, it's an M to F who needs an annual mammogram. Um, thank you for doing the annual mammogram on the M to F. Um, and I would say as far as insurance companies goes, that's going to be a real toss-up. Some companies will cover it. Uh, and it's not so much whether the company will cover it, or it's whether the employer who provides the coverage will cover it. So I could have Aetna with the city of Seattle and it's covered, or I could have Aetna with the Morehouse School of Medicine and it's not covered. I have Aetna for both, from both uh, employers, but one is going to cover it and one's not going to cover it because of how um, the insurance is set up for that employer. So uh, it's really hit or miss whether or not that's going to be addressed. Sorry, that's not very helpful, but in some cases I would it will agree be with what he said. Yeah. yeah. So uh, talking about some primary care considerations and some things that you can do even if you're not uh, doing hormone management. Um, just some kudos. Screening is organ-based. It's not gender-based. Um, male to females who are post-surgical do retain their prostate. So, you know, the opposite of what we were talking about before, um, you know, if there is an organ and it needs to be screened, it's screened. If there are breasts, you screen those. Um, tobacco is uh, is something you really want to talk about. There's a high use of tobacco in the transgendered population. There's also concern um, with uh, the hormone management. Um, include mental health screening and substance abuse, um, sexually transmitted infections, hepatitis, um, all based on risk. You want to get a diet history because trans people um, may use food to manipulate their appearance. <clears throat> You want to talk about hormones, find out what they're taking, the routes they're used, they're self-administered, where they're getting the hormones. Um, sometimes I find when I'm doing these histories, uh, the truth may come out, come out a little bit over several uh, discussions, um, but uh, that's definitely something to, to, uh, to delve into. Uh, for osteoporosis, looked at a couple different, um, couple different uh, uh, guidelines. For M to Fs uh, over 50, and for F to Ms over 50, if, test if they've been on testosterone more than five years, sooner if there are other risk factors. So, um, of course, you know, with the smoking and everything else. Um, F to Ms who uh, take Depo-Provera to um, stop uh, menses may be at higher risk uh, for osteoporosis. Um, and again, for vaccines, you know, it's the same. It's based on risk. 
for some more primary care considerations. Um, uh, Want to know about prior procedures or surgeries, including self-treatment procedures such as injections of silicone, um, common in uh, M to uh, F population. Uh, their fertility goals, um, just because somebody's transgendered, um, they may or may not want to have children. And they may, you know, uh, just just because somebody's transitioning, you know, for example, to to male doesn't mean that they, they may not want to uh, go forward with a pregnancy. After uh, mastectomy, the chest wall exam is every year, discussion on risk, it's, it is, uh, risk for cancer is somewhat reduced. Um, PAPs in, in males to female generally are not needed unless the, the glands is converted to a neocervix. Um, vaginal PAP, if they have an HPV risk or they're immunocompromised. For um, F to M's, PAPs follow regular recommendations. Consider increasing screening if there's ovarian um, or uterine cancer or family history with, uh, or there's a PCOS. PAP is not required after hysterectomy. Cardiovascular risk um, prior to initiating female hormones. Consider let me, let me um, aspirin that, and uh, stress testing second, in high-risk cases. With the with the PAP, sure. It's the PAP that's uh -huh. not required after the hysterectomy. A pelvic exam still may be required, the, but a, the there's nothing. Mm -hmm. If the you don't have your cervix, required. there's no reason to do the PAP test itself. Does that make sense to everybody? So in females to males, uh, uh, you're saying that the PAP, uh, PAP is no longer required after a hysterectomy. Yes, after I agree. a hysterectomy, you still right? may need a pelvic yes, exam. Yes. Yes. Okay. But you won't need the PAP mm -hmm. test. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, moving down, I think I was right. At history of uh, of thromboembolism um, is a contradiction to estrogen therapy in um, in males to females. Um, there may be some other kinds of things that you can do, but um, but you would want to avoid estrogen. Exercise, it's generally helpful for um, males to females to retain uh, their muscle tone. And um, just, it's also, uh, you know, good for everybody, but in females to males, you want to, um, there is a, a risk for um, tendon tears in, in, uh, in weight training. Um, so medical provider characteristics for uh, hormone therapy. Uh, primary care providers are encouraged to increase their involvement in hormone management. WPATH, uh, which is the, the, uh, the, help me out here, Lord, it's the World, uh, the there's world the acronym I'll come up with it here. It's, it's, it's one of the, Health. Thank you. Uh, it, which is a great uh, resource, and we'll have those at the end of the, the program. They suggest that additional uh, training or assistance from more experienced providers. So if you're just kind of getting your, your feet wet, you can set up your, yourself with a network of more experienced providers. And, and uh, if you're comfortable with that, um, have them kind of help you along. WPATH strongly recommends providers seek out their own additional training. Uh, it should be. Uh, done in a multidisciplinary team, where, and I would say where, where available, and I know some of you are out in rural areas. Um, endocrine specialty for patients with increased risk if they have pre-existing metabolic or endocrine disorders. Um, primary care providers can provide bridging care, which is a six-month prescription for those who are purchasing um, hormones over the internet or until a qualified prescriber can be located. Um, and you, there, you can network with um, WPATH or other clinicians, like I was saying. Um, for initiation of hormone therapy, I put down that it's a balancing act because of lack of financial resources and lack of experienced providers, that um, mental health clearance and diagnosis um, 
of gender identity disorder is not always available. Um, and I, probably some of you, even in, in, in cities, have trouble um, accessing, you know, always accessing mental health providers. Um, infinitely delaying treatment can cause more harm and distress. Uh, most protocols recommend a letter from a mental health professional and an informed consent model. Consider an informed consent model if mental health is not readily available or there are barriers, there are no mental health issues, and there is ample real life experience to document a patient's desires and distress. Real life experience was taken out of the new uh, WPATH recommendations. However, in this case, um, you know, you have to kind of balance this. You know, if you're, if you're absolutely want to get that letter, I think, you know, it's reasonable, but consider that sometimes um, mental health um, for somebody who's homeless and if they, they're just as, is no, nobody available, um, you kind of have to, to weigh that all out. Consider medical management or bridging of hormones as risk reduction in patients who are already accessing hormones purchased illegally and taking, taking them in super physiologic doses, which is uh, quite common. Uh, general criteria, uh, they should be age, about age 18 and, uh, and dem demonstrable knowledge of, about hormones. I'm having trouble with my slide here. Is there more on this slide? I think it just said demonstrable knowledge of what hormones can and cannot do. Yeah. I, I think that's all that's, do, that's right, left okay. there. All right. So we'll, Okay, great. Um, before we move on to this slide, I want to uh, answer the question about um, insurance coverage such as behavioral health. I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Um, the thing I left out when I was talking about insurance before is it's not uncommon for someone to have care denied because gender identity disorder has been diagnosed by a mental health provider. Uh, pretty soon they find that all of their counseling is going to be uh, out of pocket because the insurance isn't going to cover it. I even heard a story that a trans woman who broke her arm playing on a lesbian softball league uh, had her care for the broken arm denied because the insurance company said if she hadn't transitioned, she wouldn't be female, therefore she wouldn't be playing on a lesbian softball league, therefore she wouldn't have broken her arm. So they tied her broken arm directly uh, to um, being trans and denied the coverage. So clarification from plan to plan. Um, I'm still not quite sure I understand your question. Uh, it's going to be so different from one one uh, coverage to another whether or not things are covered, uh, and even uh, um, whether or not mental health is covered. Even though we supposedly now have mental health parity, uh, that doesn't mean that it's going to cover trans. Like I said, oftentimes any transition or transgender related care is expressly excluded in uh, health insurance plans. Um, I, so with I would also to say that it depends a lot on your local, I'm sorry, Laura, um, just that uh, a local law can also uh, affect your, your, uh, your coverage. Um, in Washington, you can, uh, Trans people can, you know, uh, go under their their Medicaid under their 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 desired uh, their desired gender, and you know, uh, can legally uh, adopt that name. So I think it, it it does your insurance coverage may may depend on your local uh, legal situation for transgender people. And that's Washington D.C., not the state of Washington, right? Yeah. Yes, D.C. <laughs> I lived in Seattle for a long time, so. <laughs> uh, Although I'd be surprised. So, with regard to readiness, <laughs> with regard to uh, readiness criteria with mental health diagnoses, it's important that somebody have 
uh, spent at least some time with the person to determine whether or not there are some other co-occurring mental health concerns. These don't necessarily mean that you would not uh, allow or, or uh, write a letter for somebody uh, to transition, but there may be areas of their life that uh, need to be addressed before uh, the transition process begins. Uh, if the, the client is clearly demonstrating that they have the likelihood of taking hormones in a responsible manner, and that you've done a risk assessment, uh, really there's no reason not to continue uh, or to move the, the client along. So here's a clarification on the question. Uh, for example, is there an area for transgender health that the employer can allow to be selected? Um, certainly an employer, for example, I used to work for the city of Seattle, and when I worked there, there was no coverage for transgender-related care. There now is. The city of Seattle is self-insured. They were then, they are now, and they've now decided that they will cover transgender-related care. So if an employer wants to do that, they can ask that the health care provider provide that coverage, but remember, a lot of trans people are unemployed, so they don't have the health insurance in the first place. So I hope that gets the answer to the question, or that we're getting closer. William, do you want to talk about some? So uh, let's uh, talk about hormones, and I'm just going to go over some general principles. I'm sorry? Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, potential side effects, both positive and negative. Uh, it is ethical to uh, fire patients who do not comply with uh, dosing instructions, just to let you know. Um, if you are starting to prescribe, um, take this as a case-by-case -case scenario. Use, again, your network of clinicians to help assist you. Build on what you know. If you already prescribe OCPs or you do hormone management, uh, you know, you already are doing hormone management. The same thing with hypogonadism. Um, get patients into physiologic ranges for their desired gender. That's a, an important uh, distinction to make, and you have to tell your lab or your medical assistants to order that right test. Superphysiologic doses um, are common in a community of self-treating patients. Uh, that's because there's a lot of peer pressure and uh, fear of gender reversal. Um, those are important discussions to have with your patients. Um, if there's a, a gonadectomy, you can decrease uh, doses approximately by a third to a half. Um, in, uh, uh, in HIV uh, antiretrovirals, um, there are some theoretical interactions with atazanavir, um, which may increase the physiologic dose of estrogen. Lexiva may be decreased in plasma. Um, for female to male, uh, here are some hormone con con uh, contraindications. Pregnancy, unstable um, um, coronary artery disease, um, untreated polycythemia. Relative contraindications, there's a whole list here. I don't know if I would just read them out to you, but um, uh, these are I got from several different uh, 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 guidelines. Um, Again, screen for polycystic uh, ovarian syndrome, and uh, there's an increased risk if you combine it with uh, testosterone. Uh, for male to female, um, history of uh, estrogen-sensitive cancers, history of thromboembolism, relative risks, um, I listed them there. The effects of estrogens, uh, the, there's desired and undesirable effects. Um, estrogens soften skin, they decrease body hair, they slow um, male pattern baldness, they decrease fertility, and they decrease testicular size, and they decrease erections. Uh, a not reversible change is breast augmentation. Um, there's an increased risk with smoking, tobacco, cl uh, clotting disorders, obesity, uh, malignancy, advanced age, heart disease, hypertension, the list goes on. 
um, use the, the lowest dose possible with estrogens, um, give aspirin, and um, avoid the, the oral route when possible. Uh, for testosterone, the desired effects, and these are permanent changes, uh, deepening of the voice, uh, clitoral enlargement, mild breast atrophy, male pattern baldness, and body hair. Uh, some reversible changes are There's increased upper body strength, weight gain, decreased hip fat, uh, and increased... Wonderful. I was just showing people the <laughs> pattern baldness. Uh, increased libido, and uh, possibly undesirable. <laughs> I think I need some more testosterone for myself there. Uh, possibly undesirable are acne, infertility, emotional lability, and unfavorable shifts in lipids. Uh, these are some common hormones uh, that are used. Um, and for estrogens, I would say the bioidentical are, are better than, in, uh, than the conjugated if they're available. Um, and uh, some of you have access maybe to compounding pharmacies um, can do, do stuff like that. Um, they have a, per, a potentially a decreased risk of, um, of clots. Uh, progesterone, uh, a little bit controversial here, but um, it improves breast development, um, libido, and mood. Estrogens, they can be oral, transdermal, sublingual, um, and uh, intermuscular. If they're a smoker or they're over 40, consider transdermal. Uh, these are a typical dose, uh, you know, uh, 0.1 milligrams per week to start and max out at 0.4. Um, two times a week for a patch. Uh, oral, one to two milligrams per day to start, max out at eight. Um, spironolactone, like, uh, this uh, will help to uh, create a, a testosterone blockade. Um, caution with ACE inhibitors and hypertensive medications. You want to do baseline chemistries, check again in a month and six weeks. Um, alternative medication would be finasteride. Uh, for testosterone, uh, come in patch, gel, and intermuscular. Um, caution with bipolar disease. Um, I'm not exactly certain of the mechanism, but I think it has something to do with roid rage. Um, I am testosterone, cypionate, typical dose, 5 to 80 milligrams every two weeks, um, or 50 to 100 milligrams per week for maintenance. Uh, you can do the patches, um, 5 to 10 milligrams per day. Uh, de consider decreasing it with psychiatric diagnoses. Depo Provera, um, that will stop the menses, usually taken, in, taken um, initially. Uh, considerations for all the hormones are cost, age, route, risk. Um, they're controlled. Um, you want to follow up with side effects and desire, desired effects with your patients. So labs, again, uh, the hint is to use the range for the desired gender. Um, consider doing a hemoglobin A1C if there are risks. Uh, estrogen therapy monitoring. Uh, you can do free testosterone. Uh, total T is okay to use and it's cheaper. Um, you can do fasting glucose, uh, liver function, CBC every 6 to 12 months. Um, prolactin levels. They're also uh, valuable to verify the dose of estrogen. Your prolactin should be under 30. If it's above, you may, you may consider that the patient is um, on too high of a level of estrogen or that they're getting it somewhere else. Check it about every three months until it's in range. Uh, with dose changes, you want to check liver function, fasting glucose every uh, uh, one, three, and six months after changing. At baseline, you want to get a CMP, prolactin, CBC, and coax. Adverse monitoring, LFTs, glucose, uh, lipids, potassium, creatinine with spir spironolactone. Estradiol levels are usually misleading because of the IM route. They have uh, high peaks and troughs. Testosterone blockade, uh, check uh, uh, potassium, creatinine, free testosterone. Um, you want to check it in the female range. 
androgens, LFT, CBC, free testosterone, Q3 months until range, and then uh, and then six to 12 months. Baseline also fasting glucose, CBC, LFTs, check labs every two to four weeks if you're altering a dose. The, the one thing I would add to that, I want to just go back to that slide real quick, is uh, the importance in female to male transsexuals to check their hematocrit level. The testosterone can elevate their hematocrit level to dangerous levels. And one of the best ways to address that if that becomes a problem is to encourage them to donate blood. It doesn't cost them any money to do that, and that's a way to lower their hematocrit level uh, if that becomes a problem. Uh, considerations with regard to surgery, uh, this is definitely a team approach. I'm not aware of any surgeons at this point who will um, provide any sort of trans-related surgeries uh, without a letter, two letters actually, from the mental health professionals. Uh, one needs to be, it used to be that one needed to be from a doctor level trained individual. Uh, but now it's just two letters from two mental health professionals. Uh, there's the eligibility and readiness criteria are similar to uh, what they are on hormones. Uh, for an F to M, hormones are not required prior to chest surgery. Uh, there have been a lot of advances in facial feminization surgery. Uh, I think the uh, male to, f this might be on the next slide. Um, yeah, it is. Not everyone wants surgery. Um, and the order in which a person progresses through, through transition is going to vary from one person to the next. And surgical techni techniques are generally both more affordable and more aesthetically pleasing uh, for the male to female clients. Uh, we've got a list of resources for you here. Uh, the World Professional Association for Transgender Health. Uh, they've got some brand new standards of care that are available for a free download off of their website. Uh, the Vancouver uh, Clinic up in Canada has some excellent guidelines. And there's also a new online guide uh, from the University of California at San Francisco. Um, that's not really a downloadable piece. Uh, the rest of the stuff from WPATH in Vancouver is downloadable. If you're in one of these major cities, these are some of the clinics where uh, trans people uh, can go to get care. I encourage you to, if you live in one of those cities, to partner with some folks in those places um, and you know, augment not only your work, but the care that you're able to provide to your trans clients. I put these up because uh, I think that one of the things, you know, as clinicians, we kind of owe it to to understand a little bit about the population we serve, um, and you know, again, trying to to, to expand our, our framework a little bit. Um, these are just some film resources that um, that uh, Laura and I put together, and uh, and uh, there there there's some really good. Stories here. There's, uh, I think, most of it's actually uh, nonfiction. I think there's only one fictional fiction story in there. But um, I would encourage you, if you don't know any trans people, to um, to start learning about uh, trans culture by um, by uh, uh, film. I, that's the way I like. That's one of the ways I like to learn or read. This is the way I like to learn. Southern Comfort is especially important for medical providers. Uh, it's the story of a trans man in the uh, Atlanta area, or maybe somewhere else in Georgia, who had, uh, I believe, ovarian cancer and was denied care because he was trans and died from the ovarian cancer. He may have ultimately died from it anyway, but the fact that he was denied care certainly uh, pushed that process along much quicker than it necessarily had to be. And that's it. Well, thanks so very much. Um, if we can, have our IT guys to put up the announcements for the upcoming events. 
And while we're doing that, if there are any questions before we close out, then please feel free to submit them right away. Thanks so much for this presentation. It was truly awesome. I think there's a question about presentation coming in now. Are you guys able to see that? Yeah, I'm assuming that's a question for you as opposed to us. Is there any way that we can receive a copy of the presentation? Um, I'm, I'm not sure if you're asking. The um, presentation tonight was recorded and it will be available on the website on demand. So I'm not sure if you're asking for a copy of the slides. Um, if that's the case, then William, you and Laura can weigh in on that. Other than that, it will be available on demand on the website in about a week. Okay. Well, again, thanks so much for participating in this Primary Care for All webinar series. Special thanks to Mr. William Campbell, Family Nurse Practitioner, and Dr. Laura Dickey, PhD, for an insightful and engaging presentation. Um, as I mentioned, it, is, it has been recorded and will be uh, stored in our on-demand section on the website. Typically takes about a week to get that up, so please check back. I also want to um, say thanks and give much appreciation to our IT team, John Brunet and Qualen Hare. Um, please note that um, the audience is invited to attend our coffee shops for the remainder of the month next Tuesday at 6 I mean, December 6th at 8 p.m., we're going to have a speaker to talk about um, school-based programs. And while our audience may not be oral health providers, for our primary care providers, it may be a good idea to listen in um, because you can see how school-based programs can be a resource for your audience and also how you might be in, um, instrumental in getting a school-based program started. Then the following Tuesday, we will have our behavior health clinicians to join us to speak about assessment and management of suicide risk. Um, and while this is a behavior health coffee shop, it might also be beneficial to our primary care providers. At this time of year, um, the incidence of suicide tends to rise around the holidays. So again, this um, series is made possible through a partnership which allows us here at PrimaryCareForAll.org to serve for, as a resource for you, the National Health Service Corps members. Direct financial support is made possible through a cooperative agreement with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, HRSA, and BCRS. An evaluation for this webinar will pop up in another window if you're using IE and another tab if you're using Firefox. Please complete it in its entirety in order to obtain your one hour of CE credit. Thanks for putting up with all the technical difficulties <laughs> and have a great evening. Thanks again to our speakers. Good night. Thank you.